Thanks, y'all. That was beautiful. Did you write that, Joe? That's a Joe Deegan original, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Thank you. We are um, in a short sermon series during the season of Advent uh, called God With Us, which is a, a wonderful segue from that song. And much of what we have sung and much of what we have spoken in this service, uh, just a reminder that God is not absent from your pain and from your suffering. God has not fallen asleep at the switch of 2020. It's not like God ruled over the universe for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years and then, you know, decided, well, 2020, I'm just going to let it go and see what happens, you know. This is not the way that it is. And one of the great and glorious passages that is related to that biblical teaching is from John chapter 11. I'm going to start reading uh, in verse 17. We're going to have to tell some of the story as we go along because really this whole narrative takes up the entire chapter of John chapter 11. But it is about the death of Jesus' friend Lazarus and how Jesus, and particularly what I want us to pay attention to this morning, is how Jesus deals with Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, and interacts with them in their grief over the death of their brother. So, join me as I read from John chapter 11, starting in verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them, Concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray that we would see you clearly as you need us to see you this morning. You are the good shepherd and you know exactly what we, your sheep, need. And we pray that you would provide it by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been at Christ the King for a while, at any period of time, maybe even a week or so, uh, it's no secret that I'm a pretty big fan of C.S. Lewis. In fact, I'm such a fan of C.S. Lewis that I, I had to undergo a self-imposed C.S. Lewis illustration moratorium a while back because I think I was just, you know, uh, I was abusing the poor man. Uh, but I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan. It, it really comes from two books that I read. One was Mere Christianity, which I read in high school, and one was the, the essay, The Weight of Glory, that I read when I was in college, which really was one of the things that motivated me the most to go into pastoral ministry. 
But there's something that I read in C.S. Lewis that had been a mystery to me for quite some time. And it was in his most famous book. There's a spoiler alert in here, by the way, if you've never read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, so you may want to plug your ears. But it's in this most famous work, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because strangely and suddenly, in the middle of that book, who would appear other than Santa Claus himself? Santa Claus makes a cameo appearance in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Now, here's the situation. Peter and Susan and Lucy Pevensey, along with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, are running for their lives away from the White Witch who is chasing them. Now, the White Witch drives a sleigh, strangely enough. And so they're running away from a sleigh that is pursuing them. And they come to a place where they hide. And they don't know if they've gotten away, but the sleigh pulls up right next to them. And someone jumps out of it. They think they're done for. They think they've been caught by the witch. But they look up, and who do they see other than Santa Claus? Now, they're good British folks, so they call him Father Christmas, FYI. But it's Santa Claus. Now, I get it. I get the symbolism of this. The problem in Narnia under the reign of the White Witch is that what? It's always winter and never Christmas. So I get the redemptive motif of Santa Claus appearing because that's signaling a shift from the rule of the White Witch to some kind of redemptive transformation in Narnia. But his presence has always seemed to me to be a little bit jarring. And here's why. Santa Claus jumps out of his sleigh and has presents, you know, for all of these people. He gives to Peter a sword that he can use to, to lead and to, and to fight his battles. He gives uh, to Susan a horn that she can blow whenever she's in trouble that would rally the troops. And she also gives, he also gives Susan a bow and arrow, which she becomes proficient at. And he gives even Lucy a small dagger and a vial of medicine that will heal wounds. But here's the weird part about it, is that he gives these presents, and then he's like, okay, I'm out. And then he gets in his sleigh, and he leaves again. And I think one of the reasons why this was disorienting to me is probably because it was a little bit too close to home in how I see God, right? Basically... In many respects, I think a lot of us think that God is largely absent. We may not confess that. We may not believe it. But we live our lives that way. He's just kind of out there doing his thing. And we're here living our lives. But every now and then, God makes a cameo, right? He pops in. He reminds us that he's there. Maybe he gives us something. And then God looks at his watch and says, oh, dear, is that the time? You know, got to go. And he leaves you alone again. We think of God very often as mostly absent. Maybe he'll pop in, maybe he won't. We kind of never know, right? In 2005, the sociologist Christian Smith wrote a book about teenagers and their religious beliefs in America. Um, And he did a ton of interviews. And after doing all of these interviews with all of these teenagers who profess to be Christians, Christian Smith coined a term that has become somewhat famous. Because basically he said that the religious belief of teenagers in America who claim to be Christians in 2005 can be described as moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Deism. And what he means by that is that what he was discovering that these young people believed about their religious life, about their faith, was that basically Christianity is mostly about being a good person as you define what it means to be a good person. So it's moralistic in that sense. It's therapeutic in that God exists mostly for you to feel better about yourself. And to be able to navigate the world with some semblance of emotional stability. And so you can think about worship in that sense. Worship is primarily an individualistic experience that is about an experience. It's not about magnifying the glory and the majesty of God. It's about your personal experience with God. So much so that you'll see churches all over the country inviting people to attend their worship experiences. And it's deism. 
And deism basically means it's a, it's a philosophic teaching that's, that, that uh, allows for the existence of God, but that God is the creator of the universe, and then he stepped out of it. God set things in motion, and then he stepped away, and so the universe and the world and your life essentially run, you know, just based upon natural laws, and God leaves you alone to do whatever it is that you want to do as long, remember, the moralistic part, as you're a good person, as you define it, and that you feel okay about yourself. I do think that there is some truth to that, and some, uh, some descriptive merit into uh, Christian, uh, the, the Christianity in America in the 21st century. But here's a question about that. What if it's not true? What if this isn't actually what the Bible teaches? What if it is true, actually, that Jesus is God with us, that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is with us, that he is magnificent in his glory, that he's authoritative in his word, that he is present by his Holy Spirit. Could that be true? And if that is true, what does that mean for our lives? Well, actually, this is the claim of the Gospel of John, chapters 10 and 11. And strangely enough, John 10 and 11 do go together. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes a powerful and a radical salvific claim. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He says, I know my own. I know my sheep. And my own, my sheep, know me. So as the good shepherd, Jesus knows you. He intimately knows you and he leads you. In John chapter 11, Jesus shows us what this means in real life, particularly in the hard parts of real life, particularly as it relates to the great enemy of death in the world and the profound grief that comes from it. How is it that Jesus leads us? How is it that he is present with us in the difficult times of our life? Well, John 11 gives us two ways. He's present with us in the truth, and he is present with us in his presence. He leads with truth, and he leads with presence. Jesus leads with truth. And so here we need to set the stage a little bit for what's going on in this passage that we just read. Jesus is friends with a man named Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. Now, we meet Martha and Mary first in the Gospel of Luke. And maybe you remember that I keep this straight by nicknaming Martha, uh, giving her a last name. I, 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 I give her the last name of Stuart. So if you want to remember this, think about Martha as Martha Stewart. Because Martha is the one, when Jesus is at this house and, and he is teaching, she's running around making sure everything's okay. She's sweeping up crumbs. She's you know, making sure that everybody's glasses are filled. Um, you know, she's making sure nobody's breaking the furniture, all that kind of thing. She's just really busy. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach. It is very important when you come to John chapter 11 to know that this is not the first time that Jesus has met these two women. He knows them. They are his friends. Lazarus was his friend. This family is our friends of his. But here's the situation. Jesus and his disciples are in Galilee. If you have, uh, basically think about, I don't know how far it is. Uh, they're in, they're in um, you know, uh, the woodlands. They're in Conroe, okay? And Mary and Martha are in Galveston. They're, they're kind of like that far away from each other. They're up there in the north uh, where, where, where Jesus did most of his teaching. Mary and Martha are in the south in Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem. And Jesus gets word. So they're a long way apart. And Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is very ill, very sick. And one would expect Jesus to immediately depart where he was and go to Lazarus. But what Jesus does is says, let's hang around here for a few days and then we'll go. Well, by the time that Jesus and his disciples left Galilee to go to Bethany, Lazarus had already died. And he had already been laid in the tomb. He had been dead several days by the time that Jesus gets there. And so, enter Martha. Jesus is on the outskirts of Bethany. 
He's going to find Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Martha meets him on the outskirts of the city. And she says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus responds to her by speaking words of truth to her. You know, um, we used to have a pastor here at Christ the King that a lot of you may still know, whose name was Robert Cook. Robert's a really good friend of mine uh, still. He's been gone uh, 11 or 12 years. He's a pastor in Little Rock now. Uh, Robert Cook is probably like the warmest, most winsome, most pastoral, most empathetic human being that I actually know. Wonderful person. And, and um, one time my wife, Shannon, was talking to a member of Christ the King, and she was saying, look, pastoral care at Christ the King is pretty simple to navigate. It's pretty, if you know what to do, it's pretty easy. If you want empathy and sympathy, you go talk to Robert. If you want truth and somebody to tell you what to do, you go talk to Clay. Simple. No problem. And despite coming down through history as just being the truth guy, right, it is comforting to me that, that, that Jesus does lead with truth sometimes. And there are times in our life, this is important, where you're walking down a particular path and what you really most need is to be turned away from it. It's a dangerous path. It's taking you away from the Lord. It's taking you away from the things of the Lord. And you need to be arrested in that and moved onto another path. But a lot of times this is painful. I'll tell you, thinking and speaking of moralistic therapeutic deism, If it is true that we get to define what it means to be a good person and that God is mostly there for us to feel good about ourselves, having somebody enter into your life when you are walking down a dangerous path and trying to redirect you is a jarring thing. It's been one of the uh, it's been one of the most painful things in my pastoral life at Christ the King because people don't like it. They don't like it at all. Um, but sometimes that is exactly what it is that we need, and this is what Martha needed in this moment. So Jesus looks at Martha and says this, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, yes, yes, I know. I know the theology of Judaism. I know that he'll rise again on the last day, but what I was really saying, Jesus, was this. I didn't want him to die in the first place. Where were you? Why weren't you here? Because if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. And then Jesus tells her these critical words. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. These words are so important. They're, They're so important because Jesus is saying, look, truth is not simply an abstraction. I, Jesus says, am not a philosophical construct. What Jesus is saying is, I am not a worldview. I am a person. The truth is in me. The truth is me. We very often, so many of us, think about about Jesus as that abstraction, as that philosophical construct. We think about the truth as, you know, solely this worldview. You know, we, we, we boil Christianity down to, you know, kind of destroying all the atheists on Facebook, right? We owned them. You know, we got them. But that's not what Jesus is saying about truth in this passage. He's all about truth, but he's not about reducing your devotion to him at the level of philosophical abstraction, He's saying, if you want to know the truth, the truth is me. It is me. He's offering himself. He's offering life in himself, and he's offering it now. Jesus offers life now. And this is where it's important to focus on not only what Jesus can give you, when you ask him, but who he actually is. Earlier in the Gospel of John, read a really interesting story that Jesus was an itinerant preacher and, you know, he had gotten this reputation of being a pretty good teacher. And so people would come and hear him teach. And at one point, 5,000 men, which means if you added women and children to that, a bunch more people were listening to Jesus teach all day long. And it was getting on to dinner time and they didn't have anything to eat. And his disciples said, hey, Jesus, send them away so they can go get some food. And Jesus says, you feed them. And they said, with what? And Jesus said, I'll show you. And he fed all of those people bread. 
And there was so much that there was an abundance that it was left over. And do you know what happened after that? Is that all of those people, a lot of those people started following Jesus around. Do you know why? Because this is the magic man that gives bread. This guy's awesome. When you're hungry, he gives you bread. They weren't listening necessarily to all of his teaching. And so they would go and they were like, hey, Jesus, you remember that thing you did with the bread? That was really awesome. Can you do that again? You know? And so finally, Jesus looks at that crowd and says, y'all, y'all don't get it. This miracle is not meant to be an end in itself. It's pointing to something. Here's the deal. I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. You eat this bread, you get hungry again. But if you come to me, you will never hunger ultimately. Martha comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you weren't here, so raise him, raise him, raise him. He wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, Martha, you don't get it. I am the resurrection and the life. Come to me. Rest in me. You will not ultimately die. And then after saying those massively powerful words, he asks a massively powerful question. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is, not just offers, but is the resurrection and the life? That he invites you to come to him by faith. And if you do, you will not die, but you will have eternal life in him. That's the truth that he is offering in this passage. Life in him now. But what about presence? This, I think, is the absolute beauty of John 11. And one of the reasons why this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible, you really need to read this passage carefully to understand the absolute power of it. Now, remember, we just talked about this. When Martha came to meet Jesus outside of Bethany, she runs to Jesus and she stands in front of him and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Those were her words. Now, you get to verse 32 and Mary has run to see a different person. Martha's sister Mary has run to see Jesus. She falls down at his feet and she says what? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Two different people, they say exactly the same thing. Same words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So what are you expecting right now? You're probably expecting Jesus to take a deep breath, maybe to sigh, and say, your brother will rise again. To say exactly the same thing to Mary that he had just previously said to her sister Martha. But that is not what Jesus does. He actually could barely choke out any words at all. And basically all he's able to get out in verse 34 these is a question. Where have you laid him? And Mary leads Jesus to the tomb. He doesn't speak. He doesn't say a word. He weeps. So Martha runs to Jesus and says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus teaches her. Mary runs to Jesus, falls down at his feet and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus weeps. What's going on here? Why the inconsistency? Well, what's going on here is that Jesus is the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep. Jesus knew what Martha needed. He knew that Martha needed the truth. Jesus knew what Mary needed. He knew that Mary simply needed his presence and his tears. And here, you simply must see and wonder in awe at the tender care and love of Jesus. The tender care that Jesus expresses for his sheep who are in pain. What this means is that Jesus knows exactly what it is that you need when you need it. All the time. And he offers what you need when you need it. Some of you are going through really, really hard things right now. It's a really hard year. 
Some of you have kind of lost a, a school year in, in, in certain respects and kind of lost relationships. Some of you have lost jobs and it's, you're kind of looking at 2021 and saying, I don't see the light there. I don't really see the vista that is at the end of that tunnel. Some of you have lost loved ones that you care for. Some of you have further declined in your physical body over the course of another year. And some of you are in deep emotional stress and distress, just feeling like three-ton weight just sits on your shoulders and won't go anywhere. And Jesus doesn't shrug that off, any of those things and more. He doesn't just look at you and say, well, you just need to get over it. Sometimes what Jesus does is he simply walks up beside you, puts his arm around your shoulder, and starts to cry. That's the presence of Jesus so important. And I think it's something that all of us need to dwell on, that Jesus knows what his sheep need. And therefore, we need to be open to the total ministry of Jesus in our lives, right? Because some of us love the idea of a Jesus of truth, right? Capital T, all caps, truth. We like that. Yes, that's Jesus. Jesus is the Jesus of truth. Jesus is the Jesus who's against things, right? He happens to also be against all the things that I'm against. He happens to like all the people that I like. He happens to hate all the people that I hate. He only challenges. He only points out where we are at fault. And mostly he points out where other people are at fault. Jesus is the Jesus of truth. But some of you love the idea of Jesus only being the Jesus of presence. He's only the Jesus of tears. He's only empathetic and forgiving. The truth isn't important to him. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. It's fine. It's fine. There's the transformation of your heart and your life is not important to him. He's really mostly just there to make you feel better about living the life that you want to live. He's only there to affirm you in the path that you take. But we see Jesus leading with both truth and presence when we need it. Are we as flexible as Jesus is in our own hearts to receive truth from him when we need to be turned and jarred and shaken up in a dangerous path that we're going down? But are we free enough to experience the presence and the love of Jesus when we simply need him weeping beside us? And are we then freed up to bring that level of comfort and care to other people? To bring truth when it is needed and to bring tears when it is most needed. Jesus leads with truth and he leads with presence. Ultimately what Jesus does is he acts. He acts to defeat death once and for all on the cross. He doesn't just teach us about grief. He doesn't only sit with you in your grief. Ultimately, by his death and resurrection, he defeats death itself. In John chapter 11, we didn't get to this part of the story, but he does go to the tomb of Lazarus, and he does raise Lazarus from the dead. But here's something that we don't often think about in this story. You know what happens to Lazarus? certain time later, I don't know how many years later, but at some point later, do you know what happens to Lazarus? That poor guy dies again. Lazarus died twice. I mean, Jesus did raise him from the dead, but he did die again. But Jesus, the one who came at Christmas, when he rose, he rose to eternal life. Jesus who rose again from the dead, sits right now at the right hand of God the Father. And he promises to return. And when he returns, all who have died in Christ will rise with him and will live with him, Lazarus included, who will not die again for the third time, who will live for eternity. Jesus does this by entering in. He does it by entering in, not by remaining aloof. He does it by coming at Christmas. He does it by dying a humiliating death. But he does it by rising victoriously on the third day. His call, his question is, 
Do you believe this? Do you believe this? If you do, come to him. Be united to him by faith. Because if you do, he will be with you always, even unto the age to come. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you did not remain aloof and apart from us, but that you came down. And you are with us yet by your Holy Spirit. And nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in you, Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we believe this? Help us in our unbelief, we pray. Amen.